Hello there. I'm Ron Suni. I'm nobody, uh, but uh, I teach here at the University of Michigan. I have no official capacity at all. But I do know this lady, and <laughs> I know her because she took my Russian history course at Oberlin College many, many decades ago, and then she dropped out. <laughs> and so I don't know what that means, but she came back and she took the rest of Russian history with other people. She went on to Columbia, and then she came back to Michigan uh, when we offered her a very prom a pre prestigious scholarship, the Regents Scholarship, uh, took her out to lunch, wined and dined her, and she went to Berkeley. So I don't know what to say about uh, uh, Adrian Edgar, except in between these various uh, iterations, I got a phone call from her. She was then in New York, I guess, yeah? yeah? And she was working for World Policy Journal, and she wanted an article on uh, Soviet nationalities, who were then making a lot of trouble in the late 1980s. And I wrote that article, one of the first iterations of what would become a book called The Revenge of the Past, which is available from Stanford University Press. You can buy it from Amazon. <laughs> See, a little commercial there as well. But Edgar, uh, Adrian went on to Berkeley working with Yuri and others, Yuri Shiloskin and others, and wrote a terrific book called Tribal Nation, The Making of Soviet Turkmenistan, which was published by Princeton, which is going to bring out my book on the Armenian Genocide next year, early in the year. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, uh, this is someone I respect and actually adore very much. I've spoken at, at uh, Santa Barbara, and they, they're great hosts, and there's wonderful Mexican food there as well. Uh, and and it's, a good, it's, it's a beautiful place, except for the occasional mass shooting. But otherwise, it's a terrific, terrific campus, and they get along well. And Adrian, you have to understand, she went to, she went to Turkmenistan. This is not an easy place. Uh, it's one of the most difficult and inaccessible of the former Soviet republics, and she wrote a book about how a nation was created uh, out of uh, disparate peoples in this area. And she's kept her interest in Central Asia and written now, is writing now another book called probably Marriage, Modernity, and the Friendship of Nations, Ethnic Mixing in Soviet Central Asia. I could go on. I could talk about the dozens of articles, which are wonderful, which are really groundbreaking. Uh, she's one of the pioneers, along with our own Doug Northrup, in Central Asian uh, history. But she's going to talk to us today about this new topic. And her talk is called Between the Ethnics and the Soviet People, Ethnic Mixing in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Please, let's welcome Adrian Edmund. Thanks so much, Ron, for such a wonderful introduction, and it's a pleasure to be back here. I actually have not been back in Ann Arbor since that day. Uh, I don't want to say how many years ago it was <laughs> uh, when I uh, was considering where to go to graduate school. Um, so it's wonderful to be back here. Um, and uh, one of the things about working on Turkmenistan is that uh, after you publish a book on Turkmenistan, you can never go back there. <laughs> <laughs> or they would have to kill you. So, uh, so I did have to leave the subject of Turkmenistan after publishing Tribal Nation, um, and, but I'm still interested in Central Asia. So my current project, um, the research, the uh, oral history research, is mo mainly an oral history project, is uh, mainly from Kazakhstan and Tajikistan. Um, wasn't able to go back to Turkmenistan for this. But it's also... I mean, my project is, it, it's not just about Central Asia, it's really about how the Soviet Union, uh, how the Soviet state conceived of ethnic mixing, ethnic intermarriage, how this differed from other, um, the many other places in the world, you know, everywhere really, where uh, inter-ethnic and interracial marriages and uh, crossings have taken place. Um, and there's a huge, you may know that there's a huge literature on um, ethnic and racial mixing throughout the world, except on the Soviet Union and Eurasia, really. And so uh, I became interested in the topic partly because um, it was something that had been written about um, elsewhere, but not so much in the Soviet Union. And uh, let me see if I can figure out how to change my slide here. One second. That worked. OK. <laughs> so um, I want to start with a quote from one of my interviews with a woman in Kazakhstan who was part Kazakh and part Russian. Uh, she said, I wouldn't really call it a mixed marriage. I consider it a mono-ethnic marriage. They were both Soviet people. She was talking about her own parents. 
a Kazakh man and a Russian woman who had married in the 1960s. Now her comment, I was ta a little taken aback because Soviet, after all, is not an ethnic category. She actually used the term mono-ethnic. Um, but the comment itself and the sentiment behind it was hardly unique. I heard some version of this remark in many of my interviews with former Soviet citizens who were members of ethnically mixed families. They said things like, nationality didn't matter in the Soviet Union, we were internationalists back then, we were all Soviet. Yet the very same individuals, and often in the very same interviews, would go on to talk incessantly about ethnic identity, about nationality, and inadvertently in the process reveal the ubiquity of ethnic stereotyping in the late Soviet era. In their stories, in these interviews, um, Kazakhs emerged as conservative and tradition bound, Russians drank too much, Azerbaijanis were pathologically jealous, and Armenians were experts at making money. These were the kinds of stereotypes that, that emerged. And so I wondered, how could former Soviet citizens be, be both internationalist and obsessed with nationality? This apparent contradiction re reflects broader tensions in attitudes in the late Soviet period when a Soviet identity was promoted, even as individual nations were becoming ever more firmly institutionalized and increasingly, as Ron Suni has written about, uh, conceptualized in primordial, even biological terms. On the popular level, the belief that nationality didn't matter went along with the most casual, almost unthinking essentialization of nationalities and ethnicities. And it's this tension so characteristic of the late Soviet era that I'd like to look at today through the lens of inter-ethnic marriage. Now, a little bit about intermarriage in the Soviet Union. In many ways, the experience of um, ethnically mixed families, couples, individuals in the Soviet Union differed rather dra dramatically and in a positive way, overall in a good way, from that of their counterparts in the United States, Europe, European colonies, and elsewhere. First of all, the Soviet state categorized its citizens mainly by nationality, not by race. Moreover, this category was conceived of in cultural and historical terms, not biological or genetic, particularly in the formative Soviet years in the interwar period, the period after the 1917 revolutions and the Second World War. The Soviet Union lacked the brutal legacy of American racial policies. It lacked a history of virulent segregation. It lacked the one-drop rule by which people were forcibly assigned to a certain uh, racial category based on having even a small amount of African ancestry, for example. But perhaps most, the most significant difference was that the Soviet Union was favorably inclined, very favorably inclined, in fact, toward ethnic mixing. Uh, this was an attitude that stood in stark contrast to the attitude, for example, in the United States, where uh, racial, interracial marriage was illegal in many states for a very long time, and uh, certainly was socially sanctioned for long after it uh, was legalized. In the Soviet Union, intermarriage was seen as proof that the friendship of nations was a real thing, that the nations were, of the Soviet Union were eventually going to merge into a single Soviet people. And in addition, intermarried couples and families were seen as in the vanguard of Soviet families. They were considered more modern, more progressive, more internationalist, all those good things. Now, the contradictions within the Soviet approach to nationality became increasingly evident in the post-Stalinist era. The word race was virtually absent from Soviet nationality discourse in the 1920s and 1930s, but the later Soviet decades saw the rise of an increasingly primordial view, as I've already mentioned, of ethnic identities within individual non-Russian republics. The Soviet institutionalization of ethnicity within these national republics ensured that these nations came to be seen as eternal and immortal, even those that were essentially inventions of Soviet nationality policy. The uh, so-called ethnos, that was the odd term at the beginning of my, uh, in, the, in the title, the ethnos, this was a term widely used by Soviet scholars um, to refer to ethnic groups and nationalities beginning in the 1960s, although the, the term did go back further than that. It was increasingly seen as a biological or genetic organism. Indigenous scholars within each national republic began tracing the roots of their own so-called titular nationality, studying its ethnogenesis, in other words, where the ethnos came from, and uh, identifying and trying to characterize its genofund or gene pool. All of this suggests a covert racialization of the discourse of ethnicity and nationality in the late Soviet Union. At the same time, though, in the very same period, scholars and Communist Party officials were stepping up their 
uh, insistence that a, the nations were merging, a true Soviet people um, was uh, coming out of this process, and that ethnic intermarriage would play an important role in the creation of this uh, overarching supranational Soviet people. Um, during this period, so the 60s, 70s, the 80s, the favorable attitude toward intermarriage um, was a constant. And scholarly attention to inter-ethnic marriage and families actually intensified in the final decades of the Soviet Union. So as Ron mentioned, my talk today is part of a book I'm writing on ethnic intermarriage in the post-war Soviet Union with a particular focus on Central Asia. In the book that I'm, um, I guess, about halfway through writing now, I take a dual approach to ethnic mixing in the Soviet Union. On the one hand, I use Soviet documents and published sources as well as interviews with scholars um, social scientists from the Soviet period to examine official policies and scholarly approaches to ethnic mixing. Um, at the same time, I also use uh, more than 80 in-depth oral history interviews conducted in three post-Soviet successor states to explore inter-ethnic intimacy as a form of lived experience among mixed couples and families. Um, in my presentation today, I'm just focusing on Kazakhstan, sort of for simplicity's sake, um, and it's based on interviews conducted in Kazakhstan with mixed, members of mixed couples as well as their adult offspring of various ages and ethnicities. Now, this is the first time I've used oral history in a project. My first project uh, was focused on the 20s and 30s, and moreover, almost all the people I was dealing with had, were dead, had died in the uh, you know, rep Stalinist repression. So I was not able to use oral history for that project. But uh, for this one, um, given the kind of dearth of documentary sources that answer the kinds of questions I'm interested in, I've ended up using primarily oral history, which has been an interesting challenge for me. But it seems to me that some of the questions I'm interested in answering can really only be, for all the challenges of oral history, can really only be gotten at through oral history. For example, um, was the favorable official Soviet policy toward intermarriage reproduced in society as a whole, or were there negative sides to being an ethnically mixed family or individual? I think we can probably imagine that there were there, that it was a, a mixed bag, but it's hard to get at that with documentary sources. How did ethnically mixed individuals negotiate and express their complex identities within a society that really uh, insisted that every person had to have a single nationality? Did intermarried couples and families really epitomize Soviet-style modernity and internationalism, as uh, Brezhnev-era social scientists like to claim? When used judiciously, oral history testimony can shed light on these and other aspects of life in the final decades of the Soviet Union's existence. Now, let me say a little bit about why I want to talk about Kazakhstan and why I think Kazakhstan is a, an especially good place. In fact, Central Asia in general is a very good place to uh, study um, ethnic mixing in the Soviet Union um, and elsewhere, but <coughs> Kazakhstan is particularly interesting in some ways because you can see Kazakhstan here, Kazakh SSR at the time below the Russian Republic. Um, Kazakhstan was in many ways a microcosm of the Soviet Union. Kazakhs like to note that there are more than 100 different ethnic groups in Kazakhstan. So it's virtually a microcosm of the entire USSR and its ethnic diversity. It was during the Soviet Union. It, the diversity has decreased a little bit since the collapse of the Soviet Union, but, is, uh, but it still exists. There are clear historical reasons for this diversity. Um, Russian encroachment and colonization in the 18th and 19th centuries had led to the presence of a huge Russian settler population in Kazakhstan. And then in the Soviet era, there were a number of processes that led to more and more different ethnic groups coming there. Stalinist deportations, um, uh, exile to the gulag, repressions, mass migrations such as uh, uh, the Virgin Lands campaign, wartime evacuations. In some, there were many other ethnic groups who wound up in Central Asia uh, more broadly and in Kazakhstan in particular. Germans, Ukrainians, Chechens, Ingush, Koreans, Armenians, Azerbaijanis, Uyghurs, Tatars. I could go on, but I don't want to have to name all 100 <laughs> plus here. But those are, those are some of the groups that wound up in Kazakhstan. Creating a diverse population that, um, has been called, that was called in the Soviet era the laboratory of people's friendship. 
As a result, ethnically mixed couples and their offspring in Soviet Kazakhstan came in a seemingly endless variety of combinations. My husband's a mathematician. He could probably tell me how many possible combinations there are, but I'll just tell you there were a, a large number. Kazakh Russian, German Tatar, Korean Ukrainian, Armenian Russian, and so on and so on. Today, one finds numerous families in which inter-ethnic marriage has taken place across multiple generations. One woman told me, we're so mixed up, we don't even know who we are. In the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, the final decades of the Soviet Union's existence, Soviet sociologists and other scholars tried to show statistically that inter-ethnic marriage was on the increase in the Soviet Union. Um, Kazakhstan, in this context, was celebrated as one of the republics that had a high, it had one of the highest rates in the Soviet Union and the highest in Central Asia. I'll talk for a, in a moment about how we should regard those statistics, but this at least was the official Soviet position. So here are the figures that Soviet scholars have given. Um, as you can see here on the chart, uh, within the Soviet Union as a whole, scholars like to make the claim, the claim that there had been almost a 50 percent increase in mixed families between 1959 and 1979. You can see around 10 percent to almost 15 percent. Within Kazakhstan, the figures went from almost 15 percent to 21.5, so uh, in the same period. So. Because of this, uh, Soviet scholars and officials lauded the Kazakh Republic as uh, a showcase of interethnic harmony and Soviet-style friendship of the peoples. Now, I want to say a few things about statistics. Um, they should be treated with extreme caution here because, first of all, there were various ways, uh, there were various problems with the record keeping uh, that made it hard uh, for uh, Soviet scholars to really know how many mixed couples and mixed families there were. Secondly, um, these statistics do not distinguish, these aggregate statistics don't distinguish between different kinds of intermarriage. Marriages between culturally close groups in Central Asia, for example, Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians, um, or Uzbeks, Tajiks, and Tatars, um, are treated, are lumped in together with marriages that were much less common, for example, Kazakhs and Russians, uh, you know, Tajiks and Germans. <laughs> uh, and they're all lumped together, even though one kind of marriage was, you know, the marriages within culturally close groups was much more common. Ukraini in fact, Ukrainians marrying Russians um, that was scarcely treated as an intermarriage. When I went around looking for people, for intermarried couples to interview, no one ever suggested a Ukrainian-Russian couple to me. You know, it was not, con unless I specifically asked for it, because most people didn't consider that really an ethnic intermarriage. Um, for the Soviets, however, for the purposes of their statistics, for the purposes of showing that uh, ethnic merging was taking place, all uh, intermarriages were created equal, and all of them were equally contributing toward a uh, you know, demonstration of, uh, of uh, the friendship of peoples being a really existing thing. The second reason for caution has to do with some of the peculiarities of the Soviet nationality classification system. Soviet citizens, I'll talk about this more in a moment, but they had to declare a single nationality no matter how complex their background was, and children of inter-ethnic marriages had to claim a single nationality. And this meant that when people from mixed marriages married people, other people from mixed marriages, the uh, figures, uh, it, it, the, um, it wasn't reflected in the statistics, uh, you know, what the, all the complexities of their background. So, uh, and then finally, I don't have time to talk about this very much, but there were also various cases of either deliberate or accidental miscategorization, some of them quite amusing, <laughs> some of them quite tragic, that took place so that many people, I can't tell you how many times I've interviewed people who've said, well, you think that I'm a Russian, but actually, <laughs> or officially I'm a Tatar, but in reality, uh, and so there are many cases where things are recorded as being inter-ethnic marriages where people don't see it that way at all. So for all of these reasons, um, actually one of the leading, one of the doyens of scholarship on intermarriage in uh, the Soviet Union, a man named Alexander Susokolov, he told me that he estimated that, there, that they were, Soviet scholars were off by about 30 to 40 percent in their estimations of, uh, in their calculations of how much inter-ethnic marriage there was. So I, I wouldn't take, see, read too much into the statistics, I guess is what I'm saying. But even taking into these accounts, uh, even taking into account these, pro these problems with intermarriage statistics, um, I think that the relatively high reported rates of intermarriage in Kazakhstan and the great diversity of types of intermarried families still make it an interesting, an interesting place to, um, uh, to study intermarriage. And I should add that 
numbers alone do not make the topic interesting. There's been an obsession in the United States with black-white intermarriages over the years with thousands of works produced on the topic, when in fact the number of, for most of our history, the number of black-white intermarriages has been vanishingly small. Nevertheless, uh, it's been a, a topic of, of great interest. So, So now, in moving on and discussing the results of my research, in particular my oral history research, research, I'd like to focus on two key issues, two key questions that have come up over and over again in my interviews with mixed individuals and families. The first is the dilemmas, the identity dilemmas, I guess you could say, that they faced as a result of the official system of nationality classification in the Soviet Union. And second, the question of the Soviet people. How did they view it? How did they view their role in creating it? Now, in the Soviet Union, each individual, as I've mentioned, had a single official nationality, which was permanently inscribed, or more or less permanently, in his or her internal passport. And here you see an example of this. Uh, this person, I believe, is a Russian. You can see, uh, if you can read Russian, uh, the, the bottom handwritten line there. Um, the range of possible nationalities was defined by the Soviet classification system, which had been elaborated in the early decades of the USSR's existence by Soviet ethnographers and bureaucrats. And Francine Hirsch, for example, in Madison, has written an excellent book about how that, how, how nationalities were, uh, how the system of nationality categorization was developed in the Soviet Union. An individual could not declare an identity that was not officially recognized in this system nor could he or she claim a nationality that was not the official nationality of one of his or her parents. So if, you're, if a parent is Russian, uh, mother's Russian, father's Kazakh, you have to pick one of those two. A person of mixed background chose, um, well, all people, in fact, chose a nationality upon receipt of the internal passport at the age of 16. And this was actually a formal process in which they went down to the passport office, received their documents, and at that time they were asked, what's your nationality? Which for most people was a no-brainer, as they say, but for mixed people, it caused some angst and confusion if they hadn't thought about it ahead of time. There was no officially recognized mixed or multi-ethnic identity, nor was it possible to declare more than one. Um, there were, of course, mixed individuals who took pride in the colorful mixture of their backgrounds. But most Soviet citizens accepted the idea that every individual, including those who were mixed, needed to choose and possess a single nationality in order to be a well-adjusted member of society. They had internalized the official view of nationality as unitary and immutable. As a result, many of my respondents describe having felt torn by the need to choose between two nationalities, often their mothers and their fathers, or by a painful mismatch between their official nationality and the nationality that, or nationalities that they actually felt they belonged to. Often individuals officially belong to a nationality with which they had little real connection, linguistically, culturally, socially, or otherwise. Now, there were a variety of factors that potentially influenced a mixed child's choice of nationality at the age of 16. One very common practice, especially among Kazakhs and other Muslims in Kazakhstan, was for the child to simply take the identity of the father. This was considered the norm. Most people did it. And if you didn't do it, people would really question you and ask what the problem was. You know, there was an assumption that there was maybe your father wasn't around or, you know, some, there was some, there was something, it was considered very unusual not to take your father's identity if your father was a Central Asian, a Muslim. Another factor in identity choice was the relative prestige of various nationalities. Mixed children were sometimes urged by their parents to avoid claiming a nationality that could expose them to persecution. For example, one of the deported nationalities, uh, if you were German, Chechen, English, uh, Crimean Tatar, there were various uh, Korean, uh, for, for many years, you would, if you had the option of taking another nationality, you would in order to avoid the possible persecutions that went along with that. Interestingly, Ensuring that subjective identification went along with official nationality was, seems to have been one of the least important criteria. Um, it was generally not much of a consideration. So for example, Timur, um, a young man who was the son of a Kazakh father and a Russian mother, because his father was Kazakh, he officially registered as Kazakh at 16. But he told me that he always identified more with the maternal side of his family heritage. And I quote from him, we all, my sisters and I, since we are Russian speaking, our internal cultural specificity was formed by that. We still feel more like Russians, no matter what. 
Another mixed person, Susanna Morozova, officially registered as an Armenian like her father, I should say Morozova is her married name, not her, not her maiden name, which was, I believe, Ayvazyan. All, all the people, unless they're in quotations in, the, in my paper, have allowed the use of, their, of, the use of their, their real names. She did not grow up speaking Armenian and felt little connection to the Armenian nation. And I quote from Susanna, no, of course I don't feel like an Armenian. There's nothing Armenian in me except perhaps in my external appearance. In some families, siblings had different nationalities, which actually shows the somewhat arbitrary nature of uh, the selection in mixed families. The parents of Lesia, a woman of mixed Russian Kazakh background, same woman I quoted at the beginning of the talk, suggested that she register as a Kazakh because her older brother had registered as a Russian. And their, their rationale was, well, this way we'll, each, of us, we'll, we'll, each of us will have one child of our own. <laughs> so the Russian, the Russian mother and the Kazakh father will each have a child of our own. This way, she was told, you children won't offend either your mother or your father. Close quote. Yet Lesya did not grow up speaking Kazakh and never really identified with this identity that she had in her passport. In a superficial sense, the situation in the Soviet Union resembled the US racial classification prior to 2000, when it was also only possible to pick one identity. And this was also something that mixed people in the United States have lobbied uh, to have changed, to allow multi-ethnic uh, uh, or multi-racial um, identities. But there were several important differences between the Soviet and US case. Most obvious was the use of nationality rather than race in the Soviet, in the Soviet Union. And second, in contrast to the United States, where it was possible to combine one's racial or ethnic identity with a hyphenated, to be a, to be a hyphenated American, it was possible to be an African American, a Japanese American, a German American, there was really no official Soviet nationality that could be hyphenated with, let alone trump one's ethnic identity. Now this statement is a little surprising because, uh, in fact, there was a lot of talk about the Soviet nation in the Soviet Union. Soviet scholars in the 1960s and 1970s were continually predicting the imminent emergence of a Soviet people. Yet this concept of the Soviet people, or Sovietsky Narod um, in Russian, for those of you who know Russian, was somewhat vague. It was not officially recognized as an identity category for individuals. The Soviet people had some of the characteristics of a nation, most notably a shared history, a shared way of life, and of course, the great Russian language um, as a common language. But scholars did not refer to the Soviet people as uh, a nationality, and most importantly, people could not select it. <laughs> it didn't have uh, official uh, institutional um, implications for people. They couldn't put it on their passport, internal passport, or report it to the census. So, I gave a talk several years ago at the Institute of Ethnology and Anthropology in Moscow, and it was a talk about the official discourse of intermarriage, something that was later published as an article in the Central Asian Survey. And, um, and I mentioned this, uh, uh, the, the, what I saw as one, some of the primary elements of the discourse on intermarriage, and one of which was that it was, intermarriage was seen as very important in the you know, promotion and emergence of a Soviet people. Well, they were very polite, but they all kind of laughed at me a little bit and said, oh, come on, nobody really believed in the Soviet people, you know. That was all just propaganda, you know. And, uh, uh, and one of the scholars there, you know, uh, uh, an anthropologist, an ethnographer, um, said, you know, you can tell that it wasn't really a priority of the regime to promote Soviet people because nothing concrete was ever done in this direction to promote that as an actual nationality or identity. So the people in Moscow, the people, some of whom, some of these people, by the way, were scholars who helped to create this discourse that I was talking about. Um, they now poo-poo the significance of it, and yet the people in Central Asia, who, who I've interviewed, um, talk endlessly about the importance of this idea of the Soviet people and the Soviet nation, how important it was to them, particularly as mixed people, mixed nationality people, um, how strongly they identified with it, how strongly they identified with being Soviet and with the Russian-Soviet common culture. <clears throat> Here you have a little, uh, nice little uh, visual illustration of <laughs> Soviet internationalism. Um, of course, for many of these people, their memories of having been Soviet, of having been part of the Soviet Union, are uh, part of the rosy memories of youth. And you could argue that you know there's a process of no doubt there's a process of uh, of uh, nostalgia you know uh, th that takes place when we remember our youth. But I think we should be cautious about dismissing their recollections as merely the product of post-communist nostalgia. 
The study of ethnicity and nationality in the Soviet state has undergone a rapid evolution in the last two decades, as most of you probably know. Um, and uh, in the Im immediate aftermath of the Soviet collapse, scholars focused mainly on nationalities, understanding the forces of nationalism that had helped lead to the Soviet collapse. And one of the primary, most important exponents of, of this uh, uh, literature uh, is uh, our esteemed colleague, Ron Suni. Uh, who argued that the Soviet regime was a maker of nations, promoting national cultures uh, within ethnically defined republics, and inadvertently laying the groundwork for the eventual disintegration of the Soviet Union along ethnic lines. Now, more recently, there's been more focus on the forces that held the Soviet Union together. People have been looking more at Soviet identity and um, you know what, what, what was Soviet identity, how did it interact with national identity, um, what, the friendship of peoples, and so forth. So, uh, and I certainly have found this to be very important to the people I'm interviewing. Respondents who grew up in the late Soviet era, another little Soviet internationalism poster. Respondents who grew up in the late Soviet era describe schools, institutes, workplaces, and apartment buildings where the population was multi-ethnic and where people socialized without regard to ethnicity. They went to pioneer camp, joined the Komsomol, went to, went to um, higher education, did their stints in the army, with a multi-ethnic cohort of friends and colleagues. Large cities such as Almaty, the capital of Soviet Kazakhstan, tended to be very ethnically mixed, a fact in which many respondents recall with pride, and of course contrasting it with the nationalism of the present day. The multi-ethnic nature of Soviet urban society, along with the rise of a new Russian-speaking generation, especially in the, um, after educational reforms in the 1950s, provided the context for high levels of ethnic mixing just socializing, friendship, and so forth in the late Soviet period. Respondents who came of age in the 1960s and 1970s often comment that nationality didn't matter to us then. It's a quote, Sultanat, a 40-year-old Kazakh woman who was married to a Russian, said, and I quote, for me, in my relationships, I never cared whether a person was Kazakh or Russian. The only thing that mattered to me was whether he was a good person. Respondents who came of age in the 60s and 70s often expressed nostalgia for this internationalism of the Soviet period. Susanna Morozova, who I mentioned, uh, part Ukrainian, part Armenian, declared that she had always felt, and still feels, mainly like a Soviet person. So, <laughs> demonstration. <I'm coming> <laughs> They're coming for me. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. And I quote Susanna. I probably have this nostalgia for Soviet times, not specifically Russian or Soviet, for me, these were not just empty words, that we are one family, that all people are brothers, that all nationalities are equal. Marina, a 50-year-old woman who was an architect and of mixed Kazakh and Russian parentage, commented, and I think I have her quote here, um, I can't really say that I feel like a Kazakh or a Russian. It's hard to say. I don't know. I simply feel like a human being. I identify more with what we had under socialism, internationalism. I'm a person for whom it is really not important what nationality I am. Respondents often mention equality in addition to internationalism as an important aspect of Soviet identity. According to Nadezhda, a Russian woman, also in her 50s, who's married to an Armenian, and I quote, everyone was the same. You understand, in the Soviet mentality, it was assumed that we were all equal before God. Well, not before God, but before the law and everybody else. Yes, that I'm a person just the same as everyone else. Close, uh, end of quote. Not surprisingly, there was also a strong association of Sovietness with Russianness. The lingua franca of Soviet society was Russian. In many cases, mixed people report that they felt like Russians because of their strong attachment to the Russian language and culture. As one Kazakh woman married to a Russian told me, I didn't realize I was Russian until I went to study in Moscow. This was true even of those without a Russian parent and therefore with no possibility of claiming Russian identity. Susanna who I've mentioned before, Armenian, Ukrainian, once told her mother that she felt Russian. And here I quote, and my mother said, how can you possibly be Russian? I told her, well, I speak perfect Russian. I got an A in Russian class. She said, no, honey, you have to know your roots, where you're from, this notion of roots being important for identity. People like Susanna understood Russianness as arising out of language and culture, not ethnicity. And what Susanna said next in the interview is worth quoting at length, and I've put it up here. I felt like a Russian. I wanted to be Russian because I loved Russian culture, literature, sorry, and felt a close connection above all to Russian culture. Although I lived in Kazakhstan and was content with this, I felt that Moscow was my own capital and that Russians were my own people. 
And by Russians, I meant everybody who spoke Russian, not those who have Russian roots and are blonde-haired and blue-eyed, but specifically those who speak the same language as I do. They're all Russians for me. Now, for all the positive and unifying features of this Russian-Soviet identity, there was, of course, also a downside, a devaluing of other languages and cultures and corresponding feelings of inferiority among those who were Russian-speaking but not, quote, real Russians, end quote. While there was no official policy of Russification in the Soviet Union, there were strong incentives for people to acquire Russian language proficiency in non-Russian republics such as Kazakhstan. Russian was promoted as the common language for people throughout the Soviet Union, and all children were required to learn it as a second language. Higher education, careers in the Soviet bureaucracy required a good knowledge of Russian. And despite the official rhetoric about the importance of the national language in Kazakhstan, in reality, the Kazakh language was frequently treated as a second-rate or backward tongue by Russian speakers, including Russian speakers of Kazakh ethnicity, I should add, of whom there were many. The existence of a common language facilitated intermarriage, and mixed families were among the most likely in Kazakhstan, apart from mono-ethnic Russian families, to use Russian at home. There were also many mono-ethnic families of, uh, say, German, Armenian, Korean, Tatar descent who, used, who spoke Russian as their first language. But mixed families, um, the majority of them spoke Russian at home. Moreover, many full-blooded, quote, full-blooded, end quote, Kazakhs did not speak Kazakh fluently or use it at home. 64% of Kazakhstan's Kazakhs were fluent in Russian at the end of the Soviet era. Many in urban areas had attended Russian language schools and really didn't speak Kazakh very well at all. In some cases, they didn't speak it at all, but uh, in other cases, they knew it to, well enough to speak to their grandmothers, sort of at home, but they couldn't use it, you know, they didn't really know it as a written or literary language. The derogatory term Shala Kazakh, which literally means half Kazakh, was used not merely to refer to the offspring of mixed marriages, but also to, in, to refer to any Kazakh who was linguistically and culturally russified. For some mixed families, this situation meant emphasizing one part of their heritage at the expense of the other. As Ruslan, a mixed Kazakh-Ukrainian man, to told me, and I quote, in principle, being a committed communist in the Soviet period meant being very Russian-oriented. So, for example, my parents tried very hard to integrate completely into a Russian environment. And actually, Ruslan went on to tell me that his parents had made a point of speaking only Russian at home because they were worried that their children would grow up with a foreign accent in Russian. Many people mentioned that if you had a foreign accent in Russian, it was a very, you know, potentially a negative for one's future life and career. Um, Timur, a 34-year-old man of mixed Kazakh-Russian parentage, noted that there was social pressure on his parents to use only Russian. Although his father spoke Kazakh well, Timur said, and I quote, this was at the time of the Soviet Union when the Russian language played a dominant role. Kazakh simply wasn't welcomed anymore, anywhere. Uh, close quote. Several respondents reported being ashamed of their obviously non-Russian names in the Russian-dominated environment of the Soviet period. There's a woman named Sajida who is part Russian, part Tatar. Uh, she's in her uh, mid-50s, and she struggled all her life to come to terms with her unusual first name. Um, she said, my mom picked out this name. It's Tatar, but grandma on my mother's side, the Russian one, was categorically opposed to it. And when I used to visit her, she tried to call me by Russian names like Sveta. I was small then, but this really irritated me, and I didn't love my grandmother because of this. I didn't answer her. I became angry with her when she tried to call me by a Russian name. Although Sajida was hurt by her grandmother's refusal to use her real name, she too was ambivalent. She recalled, and here I put this quote up on the screen, because again, I think it's important. In the depths of my soul, it was difficult for me to live with this name. All around there were Lenas, Katyas, Svetas, Olyas, and there I was with this name. I was even, to be honest, ashamed of my name for a very long time. Um, and, I, and I should say, I heard this from, this is just, I heard this from many people, not just, uh, not just Sajida. The word shame, in fact, comes up frequently when respondents discuss their feelings toward their uh, toward the non-Russian cultures that are also part of their heritage. Myra, a 57-year-old Kazakh woman um, married to a Russian, recalls feeling ashamed of Kazakh language and culture as a child in the 1960s. And she said, we didn't know how to sing Kazakh songs. Once a composer came to our class. He came from the Kazakh school. She went to a Russian school, I should add. He came from the Kazakh school, and he tried to teach us a song in Kazakh language. And you know, we all laughed. We sang this song, but everyone was embarrassed. The Russians didn't want to sing it at all. So you can imagine the situation in which Kazakh is actually embarrassing 
to a girl who is Kazakh. Myra now sees this as a kind of what she called national minority complex that afflicted many ethnic Kazakhs. She adds, some Kazakhs even wanted to completely erase their nationality. They considered themselves Russians. There was a deep ambivalence here. People like Myra were ashamed of their Kazakh identity, but at the same time ashamed of abandoning it. The feelings described by these respondents reflect the mixed messages about nationality that were circulating in the Soviet Union. Ethnic mixing was celebrated, all ethnic groups were officially equal, and yet Russians were at the top of the uh, hierarchy, the prestige hierarchy. The tacit valuing of Russian above other cultures was a relatively subtle, maybe not subtle, but uh, uh, it, it, it was uh, uh, one of the more subtle uh, negative sides of being a mixed child um, in the multi-ethnic Soviet Union. Many mixed people recorded, reported having much more uh, overtly negative experiences, being called names, being abused, being beaten up, and so forth. Um, Ludmila, who was part Russian and part Ingush, a woman in her 50s who believed fervently in the existence of a Soviet people, recalled a lot of what she called everyday racism, everyday nationalism, uh, when she was growing up in Kazakhstan in the 1960s. She noted that people constantly referred to others by their ethnicity, as in, oh, you know that little Armenian lady who lives down the street, or that horrible old Russian man who lives on the next block. She recalled being mocked for her half English heritage as a child, being called Ingushka Lyagushka, English frog, which has a nice rhyme, I guess, for children, and the like. But she described this as very mild. She didn't consider this anything particularly uh, um, horrible. Timur, who came of age in the 1970s, was far less sanguine about the state of inter-ethnic relations uh, in Soviet society. And he said, and I quote, yes, they propagandized the friendship of peoples. On the surface, there were these slogans, he said. But in reality, underneath, it was all rotten. He recalls being abused as a mix mixed child by both Russians and Kazakhs. Russians called him slant eye, while Kazakhs called him shala Kazakh, the term I mentioned earlier, which means an inauthentic Kazakh who doesn't speak the language or follow Kazakh traditions. Family members, another negative aspect of being mixed was that family members often did object to mixed marriages, regardless of the official attitude favoring them. Ludmila, I mentioned that she's part Russian, part English. She reported that both families were hostile when her Russian mother and English father decided to marry in the 1950s. Sultanat, a Kazakh woman who married um, a, a Russian man some decades later, in the early 1980s, recalled being stunned by the vehemence of her father's opposition to the proposed marriage. Her father was a lifelong Communist Party activist, Russian-speaking. He had many friends of other nationalities, but he drew the line when it came to the marriage, sanctioning the marriage of his own daughter to a Russian. Sultanat attributes the early breakup of her marriage, in part, to this family opposition. Because of the difficulties often faced by mixed couples and their children, some respondents question whether inter-ethnic marriage is a good idea or was a good idea at all. For a child, Susanna argued, having a mixed background can be enriching. But when the child leaves home, she said, and goes to preschool, and I quote, he'll have to decide the question, who is he? Who is he by nationality? Who is he by religion? Then he'll start to have problems. Close quote. Susanna herself has long struggled to define her own identity. And remember, she is half U Armenian, half Ukrainian, Russian-speaking, living in Kazakhstan. And she said, up until now, I've been suffering and asking myself, who am I really, Armenian or Ukrainian, Russian or Kazakh? Close quote. Speaking for mixed families as well as for Russified Kazakhs, Mayra said, I feel, and you can see this quote up here, I feel that we're marginal people. We're between two cultures. We can't forget Russian culture either. We were raised, we read Chekhov, Lev Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. We simply grew up on this, you know? And you know, we are receptive to Russian culture, but at the same time, we also have our own tradition. So it turns out that we are equally open to one and the other. How can we choose one? So to conclude, I want to come back to this tension that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk between national and supranational, between the ethnos and the Soviet people. Scholars have recently made the argument that it was possible to be both national and Soviet. But what of those people, like the mixed families and individuals I've discussed today, who wish to transcend nationality and be only Soviet? This, it turns out, was not so easy. Nationality categories were deeply entrenched and became more so as time went on. The idea that every Soviet citizen had to have a single nationality went unchallenged. 
The Soviet people, whose imminent appearance was discussed constantly in Soviet official scholarly literature on a theoretical level, and was also believed in fervently by many Soviet citizens, this Soviet people lacked any real world salience or institutional existence. Intermarried and mixed people had a great deal to lose. You could argue they had the most to lose from this failure to create a Soviet identity. Almost by definition, they were less attached to a single nationality than other Soviet citizens. Would it have made any difference to the ultimate outcome of the Soviet multinational experiment if individuals had been able to claim Soviet as their identity? Probably not. But I think you could still argue that the failure to allow Soviet citizens, even those of mixed background, to transcend the narrow confines of official nationality must, in retrospect, be viewed as a missed opportunity. Thanks very much. I welcome your questions. That was fantastic. Oh, thank you, Ron. Really, really fantastic. <laughs> you know, this is it's so exciting. And, and I think uh, you can field your own questions. Sure, huh? absolutely. And uh, yeah, and don't call on anyone who looks really weird. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. You mentioned religion mm -hmm. as a criterion of ethnic mixture. Uh, I know the Soviet government discouraged the expression of religion. Mm -hmm. but still, it was there. And it seems to me that that would be putting me as Absolutely, you're absolutely correct, and it was. I mean, I left it out today just uh, out of, for simplicity's sake, I guess you could say, but it was very much a factor. For example, the English Russian woman, um, uh, the Kazakh Russian, even in families where uh, people were not religious, uh, they wanted their children to marry someone of the same religious background. So I think that one thing is that uh, in my book, I have, I'm, it's about the Soviet period, but there's a chapter at the end about the post-Soviet period, and of course religion became much more important and much more of an issue for people in the post-Soviet period. Families that hadn't cared about it at all in the Soviet period suddenly found themselves facing questions about, you know, uh, fa facing children who were converting to religions that their parents didn't ag agree with, people who wanted to be buried in a religious manner, and conflicts within families over that. But you're absolutely right that even in the late Soviet period, it was sort of underground, but it was definitely an issue for an issue for people, and uh, especially for parent a reason for parents to oppose the marriage of their children to someone of a different different ethnicity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Who is? Yes, sir. Uh, or maybe to put it another way, is there a kind of uh, great Russian ethno-nationalism that was kind of hard to shake? That he, they, they were talking about Soviet, but did they really mean mm -hmm. Russian? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's interesting. I, mean, I think this changed over time, and of course, we should ask Ron Suni what he <laughs> what he thinks of this question too. But uh, I think that first of all, they accepted the idea that there was this contradiction, and that with time, you know, that there were nationalities, but there was also the hope that eventually the nationalities would uh, would you know over the long term would disappear and would create something called the Soviet people. Um, but I think the problem was that as time went on in everyday life and everyday practice, regardless of what they thought ideologically, these nationalities became more and more important precisely because of the institutional arrangements. And it became harder and harder for them to escape from that, particularly because all the different nationalities within their republics became very vested in these nationalities. They received special preferences within, you know, affirmative action preferences uh, for, you know, people of the, the home nation, the titular nationality, it got them into college, got them into the Communist Party, got them jobs, and uh, you know, e different republics developed you know very proprietary uh, relationships, different nationalities within their own republics. So it became, I think, practically impossible. Interestingly, in Kazakhstan today, now Russia has done away with the nationality paragraph in the passport 
Kazakhstan today has not done away with it. They still have nationality in their passports. And I have asked numerous people, do you think anyone will get rid of this? They said, absolutely not. It's impossible. So this, it's so entrenched, even in Kazakhstan, which was you know, not, not even, so it's not great Russian nationalism. That's the issue there. So I think, uh, I mean, of course, there was great Russian nationalism. There were all kinds of nationalisms in, uh, in the Soviet Union. But I don't think that was kind of the fundamental root of the contradiction. I think that there really was a belief early on that, you know, the, that nationalities would ev eventually, if you allowed them to be cultivated and have their way, eventually give way to the Soviet people, but that the institutional arrangements kind of prevented that and from happening. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm
From which society, sorry? Uh-huh. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And probably the same thing happened with Muslim culture in the conglomerate that was the Soviet Union with the actually very different uh, cultural society or conformed with the Soviet Union. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, my, my question goes to say exactly that. If the Soviet Union may have persisted as an egalitarian society for a long time, it may have been possible to create an actual Soviet national. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think that uh, I think that's true, and certainly people you interview in Central Asia say they think if you know the situation had gone on for many more decades, there would have been much more kind of cultural fusion under a single Russian culture, Russian Soviet culture. Uh, but at the same time, there wasn't really an official effort to make that happen either. You know, uh, and uh, to say, okay, we're all Soviets, let's get rid of nationality. <laughs> you know, and uh, there, th that didn't happen either. So uh, why there wasn't that effort, you know, I think is uh, also, an, you know, an interesting question. And certainly, if if things had gone on for another hundred or two hundred years, I think you're absolutely right. It would have, you know, there would have been much more of a kind of common, common uh, culture and common society identity. Definitely, yes. Mm-hmm. As you mentioned, in the Russian Federation, we have a similar problem mm -hmm. uh, or set of views. And we do have, you know, for example, at least for a period of time, having you know, the ethnicity offer passports to each other. Um, do you draw any lessons from you know, the Cossack experience mm -hmm. that can be generalizable um, for things like the attempt to create uh, either you know, an ethnicity? Identity or a civic patriotism, or even, you know, is it possible for a Kazakh identity to withstand possible new pressures from a Zelensky or kind of a pressure of the Yeah, it's interesting. Well, Kazakhstan is an interesting parallel to both the Soviet Union and, you know, Russia because they have tried to create a Kazakhstani identity. You know, they've talked about, uh, because of course they have a huge Russian population, all these different nationalities in addition to, um, uh, uh, you know, the Kazakh population, and they're trying to balance all these things. Well, they have said that, you know, there's the Kazakh identity, which is an ethnic identity, but there's a Kazakhstani identity, which is a citizen of the Kazakhstani state, with full rights in this multi-ethnic state, and they've really, they have, the president of Kazakhstan, the government has tried to emphasize this, and I think it has had some success in, you know, uh, convincing non-ethnic Kazakhs that there is a future for them in Kazakhstan, which has not been the case in all the Central Asian republics. I mean, people have fled rather, much more quickly from some of the others, like my beloved <laughs> Turkmenistan, <laughs> and, uh, 
Um, but interestingly, people in Kazakhstan have also told me that a lot of ethnic Kazakhs hate the Kazakhstani concept, that they think it's kind of an, eth uh, an effort to undermine Kazakh nationalism and, and prevent Kazakhstan from belonging to the Kazakhs, which it should really belong to. So there is, there is that tension there between the civic and the, and, and the ethnic that you know, I think you know, Russia has to deal with and also, uh, also Kazakhstan. And in some ways, it reproduces tensions that existed in the, in the Soviet Union. Uh, yes? Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, interesting. So when, so when you say society telling you what nationality you are, do you mean ha the, when, when the moment comes to officially define themselves, or what do you mean exactly? That's right, that's right. And so I'm wondering, I know a little bit about Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering, in your oral history, mm -hmm. I think you hinted at it, but of your um, yeah. social history, but if you could talk a little bit about that, and what history. Yes, what, oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I, that I, that I talk about, you know, in the kind of the larger, the, the book uh, that I didn't, uh, is, are some of these uh, contradictions between how people would like to identify and how they are allowed to identify by the outside world. In fact, for this chapter we're discussing tonight, I talk about this a little bit, and that people very strongly had the feeling that their, just as you, your nationality was supposed to match up with your national territory, your you know, language, and so forth, your national nationality by passport ideally should match up with your external appearance, how you look, your name, um, your first language, and uh, all so that if anything didn't match, if you declare yourself a Russian but you speak Russian with an accent, if you declare yourself a Russian but you look like an Asian, because one of your parents is Kazakh or Kyrgyz or something, if you uh, declare yourself a Russian but you have a Muslim name, last name and patronymic, let alone first name, uh, all of those things can cause, can cause problems. Uh, and people often would feel that they didn't have the right to claim Russian identity if they you know, didn't have all the Com the components in place, <laughs> you know, um, the look, the name, the language, you know, and uh, so yes, this does become an issue that people who were sometimes Russian in their passport in Kazakhstan considered this, themselves Russian would go to Russia and discover that no one there considered them Russian, you know, ex exactly. So I think um, it's also something interesting, this relationship between, you know, that when you have an identity that you feel subjectively, somehow it's hard to maintain it if it's not validated by the outside world. I mean, this is why, for example, most black people in the United States uh, who are biracial, let's say biracial or mixed race people, feel compelled to identify themselves as black, partly because that's the way the outside world sees them. If Barack Obama had told everyone, I'm white, you know, um, people would not have believed him because of the way race is conceptualized in the United States. And so uh, I think it's a similar Similar, similar kind of situation. Yes, I don't know if that answers your question, but within Kazakhstan as well. Um, it, no, I don't think so. Because, for example, in Kazakhstan, uh, if your father is Kazakh, you're considered Kazakh. It really doesn't matter what you look like or what language you speak or anything else. You might be considered kind of a not very authentic Kazakh and be criticized. Uh, for not speaking the language well or whatever, but uh, you'll still be considered, you know, a Kazakh. Uh, at least that's how, how that, that's kind of the, the um, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Kazakhstan is a very good example and microcosm, mm -hmm. you said, of the Soviet Union. And, uh, my question is about other um, former Soviet republics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did they have, did they experience the same dilemma but less intense? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Or they were welcome to use it. Mm -hmm. And of course, I do not talk about the most of it, the mm -hmm. books they uh, republished because they were such a depressing background and history. But even in, the, in Central Asia, mm -hmm. or in Trans Caucasian countries, mm -hmm. like the Armenian people, the Armenian Republic was the most Armenian. Right, so right. I mean, the main other place that uh, my empirical, you know, my oral history results come from is Tajikistan, which I pick partly because it's very different from um, from Kazakhstan in precisely the ways that that, that you mentioned, um, and uh, you know, much much less Russified uh, and um, uh, somewhat more homogeneous. I mean, the, no place in Central Asia was really homogeneous. Uh, there were there were there was a fairly large Russian contingent in, in you know all over the place, but obviously Kazakhstan was the most most ethnically mixed. And I have to say, in, in Tajikistan, of course, there are, there are differences, but you hear many of the same dilemmas from, from mixed families and people uh, expressed in almost exactly the same words. I mean, it's really quite, quite striking. I would say uh, um, some of the differences are in that mixed families in Tajikistan felt much stronger pressure to kind of uh, conform to a Tajik way of life that you, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say more pressure, but um, it was, uh, it was, um, you hear many more, you hear many more stories of, uh, say, you know, mixed Russian Tajik families, especially, say, in the 40s, 50s, you know, or, uh, in the early period, where Russian women really had to kind of, quote, go native, you know, <laughs> close quote, in order to, uh, to, uh, you know, successfully build a, a mixed, a mixed family there. But then in the later period, the 60s, the 70s, 80s, you really have the same kind of phenomenon you have in, in, in Kazakhstan, where you have this urban population, Russified, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a minority of the population, and yet they, you know, they're intermarrying, there's kind of a common Soviet-Russian culture. Um, you see some of the same, uh, many of the same, you know, phenomena there, and also all kinds of different mixtures. Again, not just Tajik and Russian, but you know, all kinds, of, all kinds of different things. So, so I would say that, you know, I haven't done research in all the countries. It's just kind of physically impossible for me. I hope someone will do more in the future. But uh, uh, it's, it's um, there, there are, there are the similarities actually between uh, Tajikistan and Kazakhstan, um, you know, in the Soviet period were surprising. In the post-Soviet period, there, the people in Tajikistan have had m m much more negative, more negative experiences than in Kazakhstan. You know, uh, they faced more rejection, and of course, they faced civil war and a lot of other things too. So, uh, um, so the story becomes the story diverges more after 1991. Mm -hmm. Ron, yeah, I, your last sentence that so many uh -huh. people lack the uh -huh. settings. I actually uh -huh. don't understand it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I guess I just uh, I was kind of. Telegraphing something, I said that what I meant was it, that, that that there wasn't it didn't have an it didn't have a practical or institutional existence. That's what that's what I meant. To, that's what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. because I, it obviously had symbolic yeah. salience for people and stuff. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. um, the, the identity, mm -hmm. Soviet identity, mm -hmm. operates on different levels. Yes. And just anecdotally, from going to Kazakhstan mm -hmm. in, in, in the post-Soviet period, uh, I was shocked one by. How many people spoke with the unaccented Russian? Yes. Uh, how they preserve Soviet tradition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in Jambu, mm -hmm. which is the end of the world, or at yes. least you can see the end of the world. <laughs> right. But Uzbek town in Kazakhstan, uh -huh. really close to China, I guess. Yeah. Um, married couples go to the Soviet War Memorial mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and put flowers yeah. as part of the marriage ritual. Right. Then right. they also go to mm -hmm. a mausoleum. There aren't mm -hmm. many Muslim sites there. Yes. So at a certain point, you know, there's this ugly word, sab sabok, uh -huh. which means actually tr uh, waistband, or what would you mm -hmm. call it? You know, trash, not trash band, but dustband. Dustband. And it means also Soviet person. Right, right. And there's a sense in which uh -huh. people in Russia are trying to get rid of this saboknost, or whatever it's called, yes. saboknost, or whatever. Well, Soviet mentality. Mm -hmm. Soviet mm -hmm. On the other hand, Central Asia impressed mm -hmm. me by mm -hmm. the number of people who have so imbibed this yeah. in their being mm -hmm. that there, there is a merging of, mm -hmm. of your own ethnicity and your Soviet culture yeah. at that level. Yeah. I have to say, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I've been moving toward a, my own position that Central Asia was the most Soviet part of the Soviet <laughs> Union, you know. For, to stay in the Soviet Union. Yeah. yeah that, that this is, and that, that that wasn't, you know, Slutschina, as they say, that uh, there, there was really... Uh, that there really was some way in which people did and still do, 
you know, identify very strongly. I mean, not, not everybody, of course. You know, there's, there are big urban-rural divides, and obviously, but that there is a portion of the population that was very strongly attached to this and that has been more reluctant to give it up, perhaps, than in some other parts of, uh, of the Soviet Union. Yes. Any well, other? Yeah? Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Uh -huh. This is great. I won't stop it if I want to go. But oh. this is fantastic. And thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.